Welcome to another episode of Comedy Wham Presents with me, your host, Valerie, and sometime co-host, Miss Purrington. We bring you articles and podcasts featuring the best in Austin comedy in all its shapes and formats. Started in 2016, the podcast project brings you funny people and their stories. As a fan, I like to delve into a comic's background and motivations, and we usually take a detour along the way. Consider the interview a way for you to get to know the folks that make the Austin comedy scene one of the best in the country. I love Austin comedy so much, and I believe in it so much, and I just feel like... The thing about comedy is if you have some conviction, it goes a long way. No, I mean, I don't know. I always love laughing. My dad is a great storyteller, and that's, I think, part of the influence was my father's. He's he's really funny, and he's a brilliant what would I do other yeah. than be a yeah. stand-up comedian? Yeah. Like, I was always the class clown, but I wasn't ever trying to be. Like, I would just say stuff and just people just crack up. And, uh, See, I want the audience to love me, but I don't want to be a clown for them. I want them to love me for uh, my own, uh, for, for what I'm doing on my own terms. No, I, did, I didn't choose being a comedian. It's, it's weird. It's like being a comedian kind of chose me. I'm, I'm needy. I know I'm needy. <laughs> but like I need stand up like I need people like mm. it's I cannot imagine not doing this hello welcome to comedy wham live thank you for joining us I'm going to keep my part brief because we want you to get an introduction to our featured guest tonight unlike our podcast you get a treat because you actually get to watch a short set by our featured guest. So uh, I want to introduce her without further ado. Uh, you, what you want to know is that she is basically the mastermind be- behind lastgas.org. So, you know, a little geeky knowledge there. But now we're going to get to the really juicy stuff. She is featured in the movie available on Amazon called Funniest. A great, great watch. She is the longtime host of Live at Cold Town, which is a, a theater up north. Yes, clap. Come on, Marcus. Leave the clap. Come on, come on. She just released her debut comedy album called Karina Has Issues. Who knows? Maybe you're going to hear something from the album. But if not, that's why you go listen to the album and download it and play it as often as you can. So without further ado, Comedy Wham presents Karina Magyar. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Oh, come on in. Sit down. Take a seat. I will too. I'm going to sit too. Let's all sit. You guys, let's have this. We're going to be intimate. Oh my God, who wrote that? Okay. Um, You guys, have you ever... What are we doing? Comedy. Have you ever felt like you had to fart, but then you weren't sure? You know, like not 100% sure, and so you thought, oh, maybe not right now. And then you hold it in until it, till it kind of hurts, right? And you're like, okay, I need to get somewhere safe to do this. And you do. You find a safe place, whatever that is for you. For most people, it's the bathroom, but I don't, you know. Uh, and then you get there, and you're like, okay, this is finally my chance to maybe fart. Uh, and you go ahead, and you, you relax your muscles, and, and, and you transition. Genders? Anybody? <laughs> no. Just me. God, I thought I finally found something relatable. Uh, here, I, I thought I thought I was co- I had a connection, and it turns out I'm transgender, and the rest of you just shit your pants. It's, <laughs> God, it's supposedly we're the disgusting ones. Uh, that's fine. Uh, you guys, I, I'm so. This, this, thank you for in, indulging me in that hack joke. Oh, there, that's how tall I am. Um, I. I'm tired of talking about, or not talking about being transgender, but I'm tired of like that getting to know you part. And so I've been trying to boil it down to five words. Uh, I think I have. I think I've got it down to five words just so I can get it over with. So just pretend you hadn't heard that last joke and you knew nothing about me and this is the first time we met. Tell me if you think these five words uh, tell you everything you need to know. Okay, ready? Uh, They are, uh, hi, my name is Karina. Does that just, (laughs) right? Does that just clean it out? We're done here? Okay. God damn it. I got that. Um, no, I'm not doing any jokes from the album. Screw you. Pay for it. 
<laughs> with two new jokes. Um, <laughs> I I, uh, I got that surgery that uh, only transgender people get. Uh, you know the one I'm talking. About. Don't worry, you, you you're not gonna have one unless you ask nicely. That's not. I know it seems like we're everywhere and like on every magazine cover, but it's not because like doctors are walking around the streets like ah, I got your dick. You know, like that's not happening. That'd be. I would have really loved it if my surgeon woke me up from anesthesia and was like, got your dick. That would have really <laughs> would have been worth 10 grand right there. That would have been great. No, so here's the thing. And, uh, you know, buckle up, because here's the thing. Here's the thing about getting an artisanal, handcrafted uh, vagina, you know, as opposed to the farm-to-table one most of y'all are rocking. <laughs> Is if if you get one of these, they they want to close up like like an ear piercing is essentially what it is. Your body's like, hey, there's a hole, let's fix it, and you're like, no, that was expensive. And um, <laughs> so to keep it from closing up, just like when you get your ears pierced, uh, you need some studs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and if you don't have any studs available for you at home, oh, uh, the hospital. <laughs> provides some to you in the form of four uh, ceramic nine-inch dildos. Uh, they're different girths, and they're different colors, which is nice. A nice touch, nice feminine touch. They're blue and purple and orange and green, and they're slightly different widths. And they're my magic wands. I named them, you know. I got <laughs> Huff and Puff and Gryffindor and, and Ravenclaw and... Um, no, not Slytherin. You don't name a dildo Slytherin. You've never used one. <laughs> that's just, it's not what you want to know. That's uh, Hagrid. The big one is Hagrid. Um, so anyway, what you do with these is you, you, you put them in uh, three times a day and hold them there for 10 minutes as deep as you can out of a sense of duty. You know, the way our ancestors had sex. And... <laughs> That's what you do. And it's a lot. It's not fun. It's uh, the worst because it's three times a day, seven days a week, no matter what. Because if you skip a session, then, you know, it closes up and back to Claire's. So <laughs> I, I was asking my doctor, like, how important? What if I forget? You know, I, I get drunk and forget things. And uh, he was like, no, no, you really have to do this. And I was like, really? Because I was reading online that if you skip one, it's no big deal. You just blah, blah. He's like, Karina, you have to get this right. I was like, why? And he goes, because this is some of my best work. <laughs> Which was like simultaneously flattering and creepy. Uh, just another welcome to womanhood moment, I guess, to have an old man complimenting my vagina. Like, no, I don't. Anyway, uh, but it's okay. Uh, because then he explained why it was some of his best work. You see, he said, Karina, because you're so tall, I was able to give you a tremendous amount of volume. <laughs> and then he quoted that volume to me in liters. <laughs> like a grocery store amounts of liters. Do y'all know how many liters you're rocking? No, because that's not a fact you need to know about your cavities. You know what I mean? Like the ounces come out, babies aren't measured, and it's not like, oh, what a beautiful three liter baby. You know, that's, the, and, and what men are putting in there, that's tablespoons. Sorry, bros, that's not, nobody's going home tonight and, you know, jizzing a milk carton, okay? Like, that's not gonna happen. Why do I need to know the leaders? I'm not a Nissan. You know, I don't... <laughs> what am I supposed... Am I supposed to make Kool-Aid with it? You know? Can I make Kool-Aid with it? Is that... It? No? Okay. Yeah, probably a yeast infection, isn't it? Um, anyway, that's... Uh, that's the story of what I got. Straight... Are there, do we have any straight men in the audience tonight? To, that's about right for Fallout. Like, two, two or three, and... <laughs> Probably questioning the one the one straightest guy raised his hand because he knew what's up. <laughs> Strong, proud fingers. I saw it. Uh, you're speaking for the rest of them. Here's the thing: straight, straight guys. The few of you are here, and if you know any straight men at home, you can you feel free to tell them this. You should want to fuck us. Okay, stop killing us. You're killing us instead of fucking us, and that's stupid. Here's the thing: take us off the bottom of your to fuck list and and, and put us at the top. And here's why: because y'all, I know y'all are scared that it might be gay, but see, we're women, so when you have sex with women, that's not being gay. That's the we're like 
if anything, we're on the Chili's guilt-free menu. You know what I mean? We're like all of the queer flavor, but none of the actual gay calories. Okay, so you can go ahead and, and do that in a straight way. And I know you're concerned, like, well, what if I see a penis? You know, like, ah, and I'm like, no, come on. Look, there's only, we're like Hatchimals. There's only a couple of models. And <laughs> if you get to inside the pants and you see a penis, well, congratulations for the first time in your life, you, you're gonna know how to pleasure a woman all the way to orgasm. That's incredible. That's a powerful feeling. Enjoy it while it lasts. Um, or the alternate version is someone like me, you know, a, a gently used, uh, never gonna have babies or a period, Vagina, you know, the dream, okay? Like, some of us are fleshlights with legs. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, the average vagina, the, the average vaginal cavity ends at a cervical wall beyond which are our babies and blood. Mine ends at a high five, okay? Like, just, congratulations, you made it this far. Now, turn around and get out before you jizz up the new car smell. That's, that's basically... How that works. Why was I talking? I'm a lesbian. I don't want any of you. What is going on? Okay, hi, son. Uh, <laughs> wow. I'm sorry you just got more sex ed than the state of Texas legally allows you to receive. <laughs> but your parents paid money to be here and they sat here too long and now you know something. So, congratulations <laughs> for that. I have kids. I have two kids. I'm not scared of you. Uh, people uh, that's, I know I my children know, know all about they were so excited I have two daughters because no men in my family it was expensive enough getting rid of the last one and um, <laughs> that's a joke <laughs> They were so excited. They were like finally we're all gonna match and I'm like I know right it's like uh, anyway uh, yeah, no, nobody's kids has ever seen their parents naked. What am I talking about? Oh, right, back to the dildos. <laughs> okay, so uh, th I had three times a day. You can't skip. And I had to go on a business trip, which meant, you know, I had to take them with me. And this was when the government uh, was closed, right? We just stopped having one for a minute. Remember that? That was nice. Um, and so I thought, well, this is a perfect time to, to pack my uh, large bludgeoning instruments into my carry-on because <laughs> the TSA is probably saying, fuck it. Um, but I was wrong because uh, the, the people they hire at the TSA, they're curious. They're like, they're like cats. You know what I mean? Like they just want to touch everything. And they opened up my suitcase and they got them all out and lined them up on a table and then knocked one off. Uh, and then I picked it up and put it back on the table and they knocked it off again. That's a cat joke. Uh, <laughs> the, they put gloves on, which was rude, because I wash them, uh, and then held them up so that everybody in the airport gets a good look of like, oh, like, I, I could see the look on their faces, like, what kind of terrorist is this? Like, what kind of, first, first we have to take our shoes off because someone put a bomb in their shoes. What did this lady do? And does this mean I have to empty my vagina out before I get on the airplane? Because uh, that's where I keep my Kool-Aid, so I can't do that. Anyway, so everybody's giving me these looks like, what kind of weird terrorist is this? And then the person asks me the dreaded question, which is, what are these for? And I'm like, I don't want to get into this. You know, I don't talk about this in public unless I'm getting drink tickets uh, <laughs> I wanted to say something snarky like oh those are my therapy dicks uh, if I get anxious I just pat them and then shove one in me until I feel better you know like I don't want to say but you don't know anymore where the TSA's humor is uh, because we don't have the color coding. Remember the color chart? That wasn't really a terrorist threat. It was just basically how much of a sense of humor the TSA has that day. Um, so without that, I just l looked and I shrugged and I said, well, you know, vaginas are a lot of maintenance. And they let me go. That was, <laughs> that was the magic words. That's all you need. Pro tip, next time you're at the airport, no matter what they're looking at, that seems to work. Uh, <laughs> Okay, um, let's see, where can I close here? Oh, how about this? Um, like a lot of you, I use Rideshare because I drinky poo. And uh, I use Ride Austin because I'm a good person. I'm an angel. And it's not just because Ride Austin stuck with us through the thick and thin. It's not because they were born here. It's not because they pay their drivers better. It's not because they donate to local charities. I use Ride Austin because they employ the best rideshare driver in the world. His name is Garrett. Has anybody had Garrett? 
Sometimes it happens. Some people have had Garrett. There's only like 20 people left on Ride Austin. You probably will get Garrett if you download the app and use it, okay? Garrett is the best rideshare driver in the world, and that is not subjective, okay? He fulfills the three um, you know, things that a rideshare driver should do. He, he drives like a fucking maniac, uh, you know, squeals tires, hops over curbs, gets places 10 minutes before Google thought it was possible. You know what I mean? He's my baby driver, basically. Uh, number two, he plays the best music of all time, uh, which is uh, songs off of CDs you get from half price books. That's the best music of all time. That's not up for debate, right? It's songs that were way overplayed back in the day, but it's been just long enough since you heard them that you're excited to hear them again. You guys don't seem on board, and yet all of you motherfuckers were excited when Weezer covered Africa. So don't tell me that's not how music works, okay? Uh, oh, and of course, number three, he's never spoken to me. Not once, not a word. Okay, like that is the three magical qualities of a rideshare driver. Uh, why did I get somebody, or how did I find somebody who drives like he doesn't care who's honking at him, plays music off of CDs, and doesn't speak to me? Well, he's deaf. Uh, and like, th th I'm not making, I'm not going to make fun of him for being deaf. I know people are trained to think that this is the part where the stand-up comedian turns into an asshole. No, I'm actually saying that uh, this country should have a program where every hearing impaired person without a car should get that and the job of a rideshare driver because they're amazing at it. Okay, um, I wasn't worthy. This is a story about how I wasn't worthy because see, Garrett came to me in the morning to take me to work, and I was dressed up real pretty that day. I was like full Sigourney Weaver, you know, like ready to just tackle the day and I get in his car and he's playing Faith Hill's Breathe, which is her banger, you know what I mean? Like, I know some of you are like, well, this kiss. No, this kiss is an evening song. Like, Breathe is a morning song, right? But y'all millennials or something? You guys don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> can, we play, can we play some of the songs so that, that they're in the moment with me? Yeah. Right? Get in this car, get going to work, right? This is what you want. This is country feminism, right? Move over, Shania Twain. I don't need to feel like a woman. I just need to goddamn breathe in the morning, right? Like, that's what I'm talking about. This, this is really rocking it for me. I love it, too, because, like, this little climax part right here, you know, where she really goes up, turn up a little bit so they can hear it. Oh, shit. Wait a second. Are we listening to the same 10 seconds of Faith Hill's Breathe over and over again because the CD is skipping? Oh, shit. Are we listening to the same 10 seconds of Faith Hill's Breathe over and over again because the CD is skipping in rush hour traffic on I-35 on a 45-minute commute before I've had my caffeine and I have no way of telling the driver what's going on? That's on me. I'm the monolingual jerk who didn't learn how to do sign language. And also, if I could, how does he really know what I'm talking? You know what I mean? Like, this is just totally torture. I don't know how to do it. And, you know, like, what do I do to stop it? Uh, do I tap him on the shoulder? We're gonna, is that going to startle and make us come into oncoming traffic? Or am I ready to die to make this song stop? Turn it up. Uh, am I ready to die to make this song stop? No, maybe. I don't know. It's been 90 seconds for you. I listened to this for 45 minutes. Do you understand? I was desperate. I was caught up in this rush hour with the slow and steady touch of Faith Hill's voice in my ear. This is not the way my commute is supposed to be, okay? <laughs> And we finally get downtown. We stop at a red light. And this is my chance. This is my big chance because I make meaningful eye contact with Garrett in the rear view mirror. And I'm like, make a sign. Pick a sign. So I do this, right? Like, turn the volume down. But of course, in the mirror, everything's reversed. So he cranked it. <laughs> and I'm like, no, down, down. And then he rolled the windows down. <laughs> So now the five pedestrians on the sidewalk waiting to cross the street are also listening to the same 10 seconds of Faith Hill's Breathe over and over again. And they're shooting daggers at me like, what kind of a sick fuck blasts the same 10 seconds? Who is driving this Honda Civic and how can I get them arrested right now? I don't want to hear this. And I, I'm stuck. Garrett doesn't know what's going on. I got to lean out the window and give him some sort of an explanation. So I just lean out and I shrug and I said, vaginas are a lot of maintenance. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Do you need to catch your breath again? Are you okay? No, I'm a professional. <laughs> uh, first of all, Karina, I have to thank you. Sure. Because uh, thank you. You just provided this for free. Yeah, I know, right? Because his parent didn't have to pay to have him come in. Oh, you mean a ticket to this show? Yeah. Okay, I thought you were going to some weird place where you can hire a tranny. <laughs> 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 to talk to your kids about gender reassignment surgery. 
<laughs> I was like, if that's a thing, like, is there an agency? No. Is that is just right Austin do that? Because I'll it sign up a for that. For everything, you no. Know? Okay. <laughs> well, for those of you that don't know, Karina was uh, one of our early guests on Com- Comedy Wham, the podcast, back in 2016, May. <sighs> yeah. Karina, has anything changed in that? <laughs> I think you're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I covered it pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> You did a great job. Thank you. Uh, I, I will say one of my icebreaker questions during my podcast is, I don't know if you did your homework and re-listened. Do you want to know what your your uh, I one not... word to describe your past was? Do you want to come up with a fresh one or do you? Yes. I didn't okay. know there was homework. No. <laughs> uh, a fresh one word to describe my past? Yeah. The whole thing? Do I get to pick an era? It's open to your interpretation. Was I this difficult of a guest two years ago, or was I more I okay. have a terrible accommodating? Memory. No, you were okay. very, you're very nice. One word to describe my past. I mean, great. I've had a great life. I had a really happy childhood, uh, which is, I know, contrary to what uh, is presented or is often talked about for transgender people, it's not that it wasn't without some really dysphoric moments that were kind of awful. And I mean, yeah, I tried to commit suicide in high school, but who didn't? You know, <laughs> come on, that's not special. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I mean, like there was obviously a lot of bad moments, but I had I had really good supportive family. I had um, no financial struggles growing up. Um, as far as anybody knew, I was a white guy. I mean, like, what am I going to complain about here? You know what I mean? <laughs> I had a really good, solid childhood, and I think that's one of the reasons I ended up taking so long to figure out my gender because everything was going so well like why would you uh question anything um and then it was just a lot of circumstances finally coming together that kind of forced me to face myself in the mirror and actually take some time to think about who i really am and then it all came rushing back and i'm like wow that great childhood really could have been even better uh if i had known this or if i had the information or the wherewithal to figure it out earlier but still, I can't complain about it. Yeah. You know, it's not like I was a tortured soul. Your your word last time was happy. There so, you go. Yeah. It's true. Consistency. Yeah. Consistency. Thank you. <laughs> Consistency is the word I was going to use, but it's boring. Nobody wants. To. I had a really consistent childhood. Yeah. Yeah. See, people are leaving oh, just with go. that idea, like a consistent <laughs> childhood. I didn't pay She's for that not shit. A Jesus. <laughs> Consistent childhood is the most boring. I'd rather watch baseball. A lot of times when I sit down with a guest, you know, they're on a very clear tra- trajectory as far as being a comic. And because you and I have had a, the conversation once before, this is what I like to call our volume two, where we revisit with a guest. You have been incredibly busy in a lot of unique ways in these last three years, and this is the one of the uniquely uh, busy ways that you've, you've one of the ways you've I know kept yourself saying. busy. Yeah, I can, I, yeah. <laughs> words are so difficult. This is why it's your, are, your really uh, hard. feature here. Yeah. You wrote a kid's book. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had these kids and they were bored. <laughs> you know, so like, what do you know? I've been working on this. It's funny because when we interviewed, what, two years ago, mm-hmm. this was a five year old project. I probably oh, didn't wow. bring it up because it was already old hat. I was working on this for six years before it finally wow. came out uh, with my co writer and illustrator, Damien DiMartino, who's super talented and is honestly the reason you should buy this book children's books and consistent childhoods. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We have the winning. I am learning so here. much about what it's just. <laughs> anyway, no, I was. <laughs> I'm sh- you have a good time in the bathroom, everybody. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, <laughs> it's like an airport. They're going to go... Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> it's a good book. It's for sale on my website. It's aimed at like elementary school kids. It's what I've always wanted, which is a fantasy... I liked fantasy books growing up. It's a fantasy book uh, with a knight and a princess, or prince and a princess, um, but uh, neither one of them... Uh, is the reason for the story. They are jointly the protagonists, and the book is very much like follows both of their stories equally. Uh, They're siblings, and it's a story about family and not about gender roles and not about, 
I don't know, your place in life. It's more about how do two siblings who consider themselves to be equals tackle challenges and keep their family together. And so I was really uh, proud of the story and the way it came out. And it, it does sort of speak to trans issues, but only in a very, very subtle way of like, you know, let's, let's take the gender out of fantasy and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Are you humble about how good of a writer you are? No. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I just did a uh, a reading at the North Door. Owen Edgerton. I don't know if you guys know Owen Edgerton. He's a very famous yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, writer and filmmaker in town. He runs a monthly show at the North Door called One Page Salon, and, and writers are invited to come and read one page of their work. And I was asked to do it, which was super exciting because uh, I hadn't been putting myself out there as a writer as much. I was a writer for 20 years. Yeah. That's my like first career yeah really. in case people didn't realize it's not that she you know she just this is like a dabbling thing this no is like you've been actually paid for writing this is what i was supposed to do and then people wouldn't stop fucking laughing at me uh no <laughs> <laughs> uh so i go in and the, and the, and the hosts were very sweet and introduced me as as a comedian and all the other stuff and uh and then i got up there and i read a very sad story and it's the most disappointed I have ever left an audience. Uh, not, and they all came up later and said that was a really good story, but it wasn't funny. Like they were mad at me. They were it's even more than the people <laughs> here. Like, they, yeah, uh, and it was just a weird feeling. I hadn't gone on stage and made people sad in a long time. I don't think I'm gonna go back to that. <laughs> this is more fun. But yeah, I do like I like writing. I, I I'm not. A professional anymore so I'm humble in that sense that like it's really really hard to get people to pay you uh, for writing um, and I was never able to like go over the top with that and so I recognize anybody who gets to that plateau is just a god to me uh, so I'm only a demi goddess <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like because you you've backed off of the the magazine writing and, and the other professional writing that you've been able to really hone in on your your comedic writing uh, I think it's more like this. I think it's more that I used to be an alcoholic. <laughs> and then I found heroin. <laughs> and uh, yeah, stand-up comedy. Like, the problem with being a writer is that you spend a lot of time and energy writing something, and then someone publishes it if you're very super lucky. And then if you're triple, quadruple lucky, one of your family members reads it out of the six people in your family and tells you it's good. That's all the feedback that you get, you know? Unless you become a super famous writer and then everybody just kisses your ass. And you never really know if you're doing anything good or not. It's the most maddening mm. existence ever. And I don't understand how anybody sticks with it, especially when there's something like stand-up comedy where people tell you minute by minute if you <laughs> suck or not. Like, it's just so refreshing. I, I, I sucked four or five times just tonight and it was really good to thank you for that. Uh, just to hear that kind of feedback. And I'm totally addicted to it and that's what kind of what propelled me into comedy and away from writing i spend more time on the on the heroin because it's just a better fix yeah. you know for i think it just made people sad again no. <laughs> <laughs> i did it i'm gonna pick on something that you said during our interview because i think it might tie in nicely you said the austin scene may be too nice now three years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's changed at all? Well, I'm mean. But you know, you actually wrote, because I know this about you, that you think you're mean, but you actually told me most of my jokes aren't mean. Is there a, di I, is there a difference? You're mean, but your jokes are not mean? Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm a little tongue-in-cheek when I say I'm mean. But, um, I, yeah. Because you're, you're, because of your involvement with The Last Gas, you really do have uh, this overarching view of the comedy scene. So even then, that observation was one founded in true knowledge. Yeah. I, I think and, that this, this scene, it's, it's hard to explain, but I'll try. Um, here's where we're at. Does, does anybody follow baseball? Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone walking? Is anyone no, walking? That's, no, no, no okay. I honestly, sometimes I feel like it's, it's the same, same percentage of people who are transgender and who are baseball fans. So it makes sense that that is where I'm sitting right now. Yeah, it's gotten that bad. Okay, you're a baseball fan, someone said? Okay. 
Dustin, I have your jacket. It's in my car. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I just saw you there. Um, okay, well, in baseball, there's the professional baseball teams that you may or may not have heard of, and then there are these farm teams, AAA, AA, single A, all the way down to rookie league, and you slowly work your way up the ladder, and at each point, you either get rejected and spit out, or you stay there until you die, or you get to go to the next level. So Austin is a AAA baseball team. Um, it's really good scene. It's a very strong scene. It's a vibrant scene. We've got some of the best talent and uh, people who are going to be famous coming through here and giving their time and performing for free all the time. But you cannot make a living in comedy in Austin. So we are not a big league city in that sense. You have to get called up to New York or LA or, or something like that. Um, and so it creates a very strange dynamic here because um, we're genuinely fans of each other. When somebody comes along who's got a new talent and a new voice and they're good, the scene does rally around them and is very nice and supportive. And if somebody's struggling, there's always people who are struggling with the same way that want to like lock arms and like help you along. But there's no like jealousy and backbiting over money because there ain't none. You know what I mean? Like there's... <laughs> The thing that tears most scenes apart is like, oh, she got Letterman and I didn't. Uh, well, none of us get Letterman, so fuck it. You know what I mean? Like, um, other scenes do are in the same position and, and fight over really petty things. I don't think it's just the situation. I think there's also a culture here in Austin of support that I try to be an active part in keeping alive. Um, but uh, that that explains it. It's not. It's not just that we're a nice. Mm group of people we're not don't talk to us <laughs> uh, it's just that we have nothing to fight over except fpia which is going on right oh, yes. now <laughs> so many people that's right who Ours, was, does, I was, does anyone in the audience know about fpia have funniest you heard person about this in austin? <laughs> funniest person in austin is the worst thing that anybody ever thought of and we all want it so bad. I was just talking to somebody who didn't make it out of prelims, even though they had a really amazing set. And uh, they're questioning their whole life now. And oh, no. uh, it was, yeah, it's for, oh. a, for a Sunday night, $5 show. Who, <laughs> like, why? <laughs> um, but yeah, it matters a lot if. Uh, it is fascinating to the, win that. The, the different comics that I talk to, have their relationship to this contest. You know, some can be really laid back and zen about it, or maybe on the drive home, they're. They're panicked about it. And More then others are Yeah. I think it's, it's the people who have done it so many times. They're like, yeah, I, I understand what this is. This is me doing six minutes of comedy for the local Amy's ice cream franchise <laughs> who may or may not like me. <laughs> and it's good for the for the comedy club. You know, it's booking. It's very good for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think Cap City uh, has created a wonderful thing, and I'm surprised. I was surprised when I first got into comedy that this is not a normal thing. Honestly, that we're very lucky in Austin to have something like this, where 250 people get to audition for the club essentially, but also compete for real money, and also have industry come in and watch them. What Cap City puts together every year is nothing short of amazing, and uh, is probably the best thing they do for local comics in the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, and other clubs and other scenes don't do this, uh, which I, I thought it was just a thing that all clubs did so they should absolutely be commended for torturing us every single year <laughs> indeed so if yeah. you have a chance from sunday to tuesday for the next 500 weeks yeah <laughs> the, the contest is on <laughs> yeah i'm on easter sunday this year uh which is is that's not changing my material one bit that's gonna be fun <laughs> some quick math it's about rebirth <laughs> oh, there you go that's and right. eggs are the lack thereof i think <laughs> <laughs> new baskets okay go ahead move on to your next questions size leaders mm -hmm. you uh I, I forgot to mention this in the introduction you actually have two podcasts one is yeah. is thanks academy which i think one of your taglines is it's random academy award best picture winners with random friends yep and you Pick people who've never seen the particular movie, or you try to. Yeah, what I do is I, uh, we're watching all the Best Picture winners, because I had only seen 12 of them out of 90, and I was like, well, I want to watch all these, but instead of 
keeping that to my damn self, I started a podcast. The jo- <laughs> See, the joke, the, the cliche joke is that every white man in America has a podcast, right? So that's why I have two. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that, that dad joke just came to me. Okay. Um, so I wanted to watch all these Best Picture winners, and I thought, that actually is an interesting idea for a podcast. And it turns out like nine other people also are doing that podcast. Um, where they watch all the best picture winners. So my twist was to have a different person watch it with me each time, and I'm like, I'll pick all my comedian (laughs) friends, and people will love it. Um, So what I do is I pick the person, and then they pick a couple random numbers, and it generates a couple of the movies off the list, and whichever one they know the least about is the one that we watch together. Um, Now, there's a couple times I put my thumb on the scales. Like I looked high and low to make sure I found someone who had not only not seen Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, but hadn't seen any of the Lord of the Rings or read the books or (laughs) the old movies or anything like that, a complete noob, uh, because I just wanted somebody to really feel tortured for three and a half hours. (laughs) And it worked. Well, speaking of feeling tortured, I decided to to uh, dip my toe and listen. And you know which one I chose to listen to? Lord of the Rings? Roxy Castillo and Schindler's oh, List. Oh, Schindler's List. <laughs> Schindler's List. It's a comedy podcast. And the rules of my game dictated that at some point we had to watch Schindler's List. <laughs> And Roxy Castillo, for those of you that don't know, is like the light of, of the universe, happy person. Just... Extremely sensitive. Just yeah. Like yeah. Extremely yeah. sensitive. <laughs> yes. Emotional, emotive, empathetic it was person. very palpable listening to that episode. God, she was so, we are still mad at each other for that one. <laughs> but it's the most offensive episode that we've ever put out, and I'm still proud of it. Not like we weren't awful. We weren't no, like, just, just, you know, but it just, you you have to, in order to maintain any sorts of sense of humor about it, you have to crack some jokes. And it's hard cracking jokes about the yeah. Holocaust. Yeah. <laughs> I encourage you to listen to it. It was not a good advertisement for it, but it is a fun episode. <laughs> it was well done yeah. with with the, the subject at hand. Thank you. Then you have your playful one, Weird Brunch. Yep. With Lisa Friedrich. Yep, and, and Whitney, Whitney Lamond. Whitney Lamond, we just look up the weirdest stories we can on the internet, and then we drink a whole bunch of White Claw, and we tell them to each other. <laughs> uh, which is kind of what we were doing anyway, and we just uh. flipped on microphones for it. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I think we all have our different... Whitney really likes the murder stuff, and it's a big podcast thing. People like listening to murder stuff, so Whitney's your blood and guts gal. Uh, Lisa Friedrich believes everything she reads on the internet, so she brings in all the aliens and mysteries and conspiracies that just flat out obviously aren't true, but she believes them. Uh, And then I'm a geography nerd, so I read like history stories about weird islands that nobody's heard of. I'm honestly the worst part of that podcast. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh. No, I'm the, I'm the, well, actually, person on that podcast, which somebody has to, because they're both so wrong about so many things. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of recording, I would love if we could spend the bulk of the rest of our time talking about this album that you just released yeah, last sure. week. Okay. Hot off the presses, the digital presses, I guess. Yes. Yeah. It's heated. Are you up. doing a vinyl? No. <laughs> no, no, it's digital only. That's expensive stuff. And this Karina has issues? Yep. Oh, you're leaving at the best part. No, that's that's appropriate. Okay, so consist- <laughs> consistency. What was the second thing? You know, sometimes you know enough about a person. You've learned <laughs> And it's my fault because I jumped in with like the most you would want to know about me the minute I got on stage. So it's totally I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you told me that this project took you six years. What six years with the material? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the album. How long? When did you say to yourself, "I want to, I want to do an album"? Um. Well, I was trying to make a goal for 2018 um, in comedy because I can't move. I've got my kids, so uh, and I'm old. Uh, I'm f- <laughs> You know, I'm 40. I'm not going to L.A. to live in Silver Lake and wait to get on the comedy. St- just no. I, you know, mm-mm. 
Um, so like, what are my comedy goals? What do I want to do if I don't want to actually like go pitch my hat into the biz that is show? And I came up with a list of very superficial accomplishments and putting out an album was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and it just, it, it been, I felt like I had six good years worth of material that I didn't want to necessarily keep doing on stage and an album was a good excuse to put it out there and keep it out there without having to have it come out of my mouth because I knew that, that I was having the surgery and uh, that I knew that after I had the surgery, I suddenly, for some reason, wouldn't want to do dick jokes anymore. And so <laughs> <laughs> it all kind of came together nicely as a way for me to retire some stuff um, that I was proud of and that, that I knew worked really well, but I didn't want to necessarily perform anymore. Were there any surprises for you along the way of this, this creating this comedy album experience? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the night of the recording, my babysitter didn't show up. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, I just flat out did not show up. So I had to take my kids uh, to the recording. They're seven and five. They don't want to go to a comedy recording <laughs> at 10 o'clock on a Friday or whatever it was. Um, now, for those of you that don't know, though, you have on occasion brought your daughters to shows. They hate it every time. <laughs> they really do. This is their least favorite thing about me. They like that I'm funny and that I'm good at it or whatever, but they don't like witnessing it. Uh, <laughs> this have made that super clear to me. Uh, they find it traumatic and awful. And so I <laughs> generally don't bring them to shows. I totally try to honor that. Um, you know, it is. It's traumatic and awful. Who wants to? Yeah, anyway, right. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so I leave. I usually leave them at home. But I had to bring them with me. So what I did is um, I asked my opener to babysit them at the ice cream parlor down the street while I did my thing. But it definitely like. <laughs> took all the nerves and jitters about recording away because all I was thinking was uh, I just gave my children to a comedian and sent them <laughs> to the Grand on airport. <laughs> <laughs> I may get an album out of this and with any luck still have two children. Uh, that was, yeah, it was nerve wracking and weird, but I was kind of nice to be pulled out of my headspace a little bit. And yeah. It just became almost a regular show because I had too many things on my mind at once, and it was nice. I think that comes across. It's a really loose album. Most people, like, I think really hone and get it super tight, and, and, and that's good, uh, and that's what you should do. And I put out this, <laughs> which is just, like, more like my usual stuff, which is very loose and... And in the moment, I did I did jokes on the album uh, that I had never told on stage before j just to do that, just to be wow. like that. Uh, one of them is the Faith Hill thing that you just mm -hmm. heard, because uh, that one worked. Yeah, yeah. I recognize that. That's on the, the album. Yeah. A very early version of that is on the album. Mm -hmm. Very different, I think. Yeah, we just re uh, released, because I wanted to do a review, kind of do the whole whole promo package uh -huh. so i wrote a review and one of the things that i noticed about the the album overall the feel that you get from it is you you have the gradual crescendo and the the tsa transgender tsa mm -hmm. track is the one that like really gives you the powerful punch <laughs> and then because you're so nice you kind of <laughs> ease us into the 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 closing track and the way i wrote the review is i said you're you're such a, a gifted and talented writer that y you want it to both creep us out in the m best way possible, but also be really adorable about it. That is so nice of you. Uh, <laughs> that implies so much more thought than actually went into that bit. Uh, yeah, I, I end. I I always crescendo because I just love ending by yelling at the audience. As, as evidence to that. Just, something about the magic of getting to shout at people is what keeps me going but the 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 bit you're talking about i all it is is i just have this children's book called hug a bug that uh, we bought for my kids when they were very little and we'd read it to them all the time and one day after a couple glasses of wine i was reading it to my kid and i realized if i just replaced every uh time the word hug came up with fuck it was the funniest thing <laughs> i'd ever read in my whole life <laughs> And I immediately put the kid to bed and I ran out to my co-parent and I said, listen to this, listen to this. And I pulled the book out and she goes, I've heard the goddamn book. And I'm like, no, 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 check, check it out, check it out, check it out. Tell me if you think this is funny. And I started reading the book with fuck instead of hug. And she was just looking at me like, you are sick and twisted. Why are you doing this to me? This is the awfulest. And that's when I knew it was a great comedy yeah. bit. You know, like, so I, 
I started doing that as a closer, and it just it it just works, and it took yeah. zero effort on on my part. It was like one dumb insight turned into a joke. Still feel guilty about that joke, <laughs> uh, and I'm so glad that I never have to do it again <laughs> because it's on the album. So. Yeah, it was not any of that deep thought that you. Yeah. It well. was just it was just me being drunk with my children. <laughs> yeah. This tipsy, is being recorded. tipsy, tipsy, not drunk. Is, okay, all right. So and they were babies. Being... What was? <laughs> There's not much. What are you gonna do? They're a baby. Don't get out of the crib. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to tell us about the album? Because what I'd like to do is see if we can get a, an audience question before we do our, our wrapping. Uh, yeah. I mean, if, if anybody wants one question answered before they also walk out of the show, yeah. this is the time. <laughs> this is the time. <laughs> to <do> it. No. <laughs> I'm really not hurt. I get it. I have place. It's cool. Okay. Um, no, there's not. The album is, uh, I'm very proud of it. It's cool. It's good. Uh, you should buy it. That's, is that how you mark it? I'm not good at marketing. I mean, anybody should follow, look, follow you on, on Facebook and Twitter okay. because your marketing and promotion of the album leading up to it. Oh, my God. Just, you were... I am so bad at Twitter. I'm like the oh. world's worst Twitter follower. Okay, maybe Don't. I was just looking at Facebook then. Oh, am I but, bad at... Let's see, that's bad marketing. And I was just talking to John Rabin about this. We were... No, it wasn't John. No, it was Mike Wiebe. Um, <laughs> we were complaining because we're old. Um, and we were complaining about how everybody else in the comedy game is a millennial, so they grew up with the idea that being famous is good and you should want it. And so they're really good at marketing and coming up with viral concepts and building their Twitter followings. And then like me and Mike Wavy being Gen X, we're like, we grew up with this idea that being famous is shameful, and if you accidentally <laughs> achieve it, you should shoot yourself in the face like Kurt Cobain, or you <laughs> suck, right? Like that's my generation. And so my like the, the late boomers and the early millennials are killing it in comedy and if you look at Gen X comedians we'll try to find them that's all I'm saying like, there's just, <laughs> none of us know how to do this shit anymore we were totally relying on Johnny Carson to make us famous and then like every single one of our heroes turned out to be a monster and probably yeah. half of us and so, you know like <laughs> It's just the worst. And so uh, I'm glad that anybody has heard about this album at all. And I'm sorry if I said something that made you not want to get it. That's just me sucking at marketing. <laughs> all right. With that, a question from the audience. Okay. All right. Shy, Shy crowd. I think I intimidate people because I'm tall and mean <laughs> and imposing. What age? Or, or how did you start? How did you come into comedy? Uh, it was honest. I was 30, maybe 31. So kind of late. Um, before then, I was I was doing comedy adjacent things. I made a movie that, that was funny or tried to be. And I uh, did a lot of comedy writing. And like I tried improv and sucked at it. And <laughs> uh, But I never did stand up until I was came here when I was 30. And honestly, I'd just gotten fired from a job. And uh, uh, I was about to have a baby. And I was freaking out. And I had a midlife crisis early. And I got on stage. And two or three people laughed at me. Uh, and that was all I needed. <laughs> it was all the validation that I needed to do this for 10 years. Um, so it's one of those classic, I must have just been broken in this way stories. But the great thing about comedy origin stories is they all essentially start with, I just did it. Um, because that's how you do comedy. You go to an open mic and you just do it. And it turns out to be really boring at parties when people inevitably ask the question. But, um, you know, uh, I think you try it and you instantly know whether or not this torture is for you, you know? <laughs> this constant, like, <laughs> bounce back and forth between extreme walk out of the room rejection and, uh, you know, adulation. Yeah. Yeah. What's next? What's, what's on your Oh, I think you meant on this show. And I was like, no. I think we're done. Yeah, no, well, uh, <laughs> oh, what's no next for me? Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I should have a goal. Well, you wrote you wrote down the list. This was the album was on your list, and yeah, you... the album was the list. Oh, that uh, was it. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm competing in funniest person in Austin. I, I would like to make it to semifinals. Uh, that would be nice. You have made it to finals one few... time, one okay. time in ten years. I got to I got to finals every other time. I've failed miserably. Um, 
No, I, uh, I'm, I'm having a good year so far. I, I want to uh, try writing. I want to try getting onto a, into a writer's room mm. somehow in some magic way that doesn't require me to move to New York or L.A. I don't think that exists, but that's what my mind is puzzling mm. on is if there's some way to like be on the staff for uh, John Oliver or Samantha Bee or somebody like that without having to physically be there. Right. Uh, I don't know if that exists. Yeah, it um, seems like that's the the headbutting against the wall. Yeah, like for people who would succeed in LA in New York. Yeah, but feel like they need to stay or have to stay in in Austin. Yeah, if you'd asked me two years ago, I would have said my goal is to become the first semi well known transgender comedian. But uh, two, three, four people beat me to it, so I give up. <laughs> <laughs> Never I did. I did up. Google transgender comedian the other day just to check my own SEO. It's not weird. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Eddie Izzard popped up, and I was like, "Oh yeah!" Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow, that game is over before it even started. I forgot about Eddie Izzard. Okay, because <laughs> I was gonna write a press release like, you know, first transgender oh. comedian to release an album in America, and it was like, no, not even close. Hmm. Some of them have HBO specials. It's okay. It's, it's, what, am I going to get on the dollar bill for that? <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? All right. Yeah. Let's wrap up. Okay. okay. One word to describe your future. <sighs> <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, the one word I would like to, to be able to say is fulfilling. I just, um, I'm really focused on fulfillment. Uh, I've done a lot to get my life aligned the way I want it to. And I just want to be able to be old and look back and say I had a fulfilling life. And I think that's why I do so many things because, uh, you know, maybe some of them I'll actually remember when I have dementia. <laughs> do you want to know what you said last time? No. Okay. Yes. What? <laughs> You said living in the present. Oh, well, that happened already. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's in the past. Now I got to talk about the future. That's a whole complicated philosophy thing that I can't get into right now. I don't want to still be living in the present. Oh, my God. Let's move on. <laughs> All right. Tell us where we can find you on social media. Do yep. do your rigmarole of plugs and promotions. I do one thing now. I made it easy. KarinaMagyar.com. Everything's there in my Twitter, my Facebook, my book, my album, my party, my launch party coming up uh, April 17th. It's going to have Chris Cubis and Ariel Isaac Norman and Avery Moore on it. So uh, it's going to be a really good time. It's at a private house. There's going to be free booze. You should want to come to that. Um, and uh, anything you want to know about me, where I'm performing, what I'm doing, who's writing about me, how I feel about myself that day, what kind of, what the shape of the shit I took, I'll maybe post that on there. Anyway, it's all at Karina Magyar. Dot com. The end. All right. I'm going to make a couple of closing comments. First of all, a huge thank you to Fallout Theater for giving us the opportunity yep, to totally. do this live. Yep. Thank you to Dustin Spalock for recording this. We will release this as a podcast with a written article on ComedyWham.com, and the podcast is available on your po favorite podcast player. The music that you heard earlier was composed by Matt Farley of Motern Media. And that was the Faith clips, Hill. the clips. Hmm? <laughs> what? That was Faith Hill. Oh. <laughs> oh, and then there was Faith Hill. Do we have to give credit for that? Do we have to get licensing rights it's only, for it's, playing It's that? exactly as long of a clip as I'm allowed to use. Okay, perfect. perfect. Coincidentally, because <laughs> you do things by the book. You, uh, yeah, you know the this actual stuff. repeating yeah. clip was 20 seconds, but I cut it down <laughs> to a fair use friendly 12 for you guys. Nice. Yeah. Thank you, mm -hmm. and thank you to my comedy wham partners in crime, Laura Smith, Richard Goodwin, and. The child who got free sex education and transgender education tonight is mine. <laughs> so, so you already knew all this. Yay. Yeah. To good parenting. Yeah. <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed learning about how Karina got to be the comedic genius that you heard today just as much as I have. And uh, we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We, our website is comedywham.com. And this has been Comedy Wham! Live with Karina Magyar. I'm Valerie, and that's been funny. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. Yeah.